John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello once again. Hi, Todd. We're at, we're at alone again. Greg is still off in the wild blue yonder someplace. And it's a bit of a shame because I think he would have a lot, of, a lot to say about the one we're going to talk about today. And most of what he would have to say could actually be uh, family friendly. Some of it would not be, and I'll, uh, I'll let you take it away from there. All right, so one of the, one of the things, that, one of the accidents that we've discovered is one that really breaks my heart a little bit here, because it involved an airplane that hadn't flown in quite some time. It looks like since 2006, it had been sitting, and it was sold in, uh, just a few years ago to an individual with the intentions of uh, restoring it and time that out of his, uh, you know, like so many of these time escapes you and he didn't have the time to work on it. So he subsequently sold it to somebody from Florida. That somebody from Florida happened to be a mechanic with IA authorization. And this is the part that bothers me that he came up and worked on this airplane uh, and then decided to fly it back to Florida. So obviously he had done some work because he got the engine running. He, he uh, ran it for about half an hour <clears throat> or an hour. I forget what the report said. <clears throat> but, uh, on the ground, just to uh, you know to make sure that everything was running properly, and it was, except it was overheating. And then he discovered that he had bird's nests inside the engine which I find troubling because that's one of the first things that you, you know, would look for because an airplane sitting that long on an airfield is, is a nest. Everything climbs into them, including into your pedostatic system and so on. So it's, it's a little troubling that, that he ran the engine before he found the nest. And then uh, he did a little more work and decided to take it off. And he had another person with him. And on takeoff, before he even left the ground, the engine was heard to be backfiring and sputtering. But he took off and went around the patent. And there was no reports of anybody on the ground about anything unusual about his flying around for about 30 minutes. And then he proceeded to take off on his intended route and to get fuel in some other location. And he made the other location, I think it said he took 66 gallons of fuel and then he crashed, stalled the airplane. Looks like, you know, and without a recorder and, and without any knowledgeable, really knowledgeable people, but it does look like he had a problem on that takeoff and was trying to come back to the field. He was making the impossible turn and stalled the airplane, which is typical uh, when people try to make that U-turn to go back to the airport they just took out from, because uh, it usually indicates an engine problem and loss of power at that point in time is a natural, it's a disaster. 
you know, at that point, you should be looking for a place to put it down. It looks like this was a very wooded area that he was in. So he was probably didn't want to put it down in the trees. He just got this airplane. And it may not have even been insured yet. So he was probably not too willing to put it in the trees. And he was trying to get it back to open field or the airport and didn't make it. And both of them perished, which is a real tragedy. I can't believe that that a maintenance guy would do that. Now, there's decision making uh, on several levels, both as a, a, a new owner, as a mechanic and as a pilot. And let's start with the beginning. This was an event that happened in North Carolina. This uh, the accident pilot lived in Florida, drove up from Florida to do some work on the aircraft, drove back to Florida at some point, then drove back again to North Carolina. So we're talking one and a half round trips to Florida by ground over a two week period of trying to repair this airplane. There was mention in both the accident report and the public docket about several changes that were made and upgrades made to the plane, primarily to the engine. Nothing was said about the instrumentation on the aircraft. And again, this was a 1963 Comanche, uh, had been sitting, uh, not flying for 15 years between 2006 and 2011. And the mechanic goes and, and does some repairs on the aircraft, but apparently did not do as thorough an initial uh, evaluation as he should have, because in my opinion, I'm not a mechanic. If you have something sitting on the ground for 15 years and you're a, an experienced mechanic who's also an experienced pilot, had about 100 hours of flying in a different kind of uh, Piper uh, during the previous year. So he, this person was not unfamiliar with aircraft. You would think they would do a more of a teardown inspection, make sure there was nothing living, growing, et cetera, in various parts of the aircraft. That said, uh, the other decision making is if you're looking at the eyewitness accounts from the accident flight, if the aircraft is sputtering and whatnot during the takeoff run, why take off? Why not abort on the runway? Figure out what's going on before you take off again. And once in the air, again, as John pointed out, uh, try to do a turn apparently at low altitude. And unfortunately, there's no ADSB or recorders or any other information. So we're just guessing at how high this person was. But typically, small single engine aircraft, engine problem shortly after takeoff, unless you have some altitude under you, several hundred feet, 800 feet, 1,000 feet, uh, making a turn back to the departure runway is usually going to be a very challenging thing, assuming nothing's wrong with the aircraft. This is an aircraft that hadn't flown in 15 years, had a short evaluation flight of some sort beforehand, and uh, you load it up with fuel and you have a passenger on board. And it's an unfamiliar model, apparently, to this person because his logbooks do, do, do not indicate that he had any recent time in this version of the Piper, the Comanche version. And so, again, it's a frustrating and a bit of a head scratcher. The several decisions that had to be made to put himself and his passenger in that position. Yeah, it's, it's really crazy. It's stupid. Uh, and he's an IA too, not just a mechanic, but he's an inspector. It's inspector authorization. So that means he's been around a while and that, that can lead to complacency and that can lead to some problems. You know, you, you think you know more than that, than you really do sometimes. And so got to assume he did a decent inspection on the fuselage of the airplane to make sure. But when I'm looking at how much time he spent in the area, it wasn't a lot of time. So, you know, he had less than two days, as best we can tell from the documentation that's available, uh, less than two days to work on that airplane. And the fact that he was out running it and it overheated, and the cause of which was bird nests, tells me that he didn't do a very thorough job of, of uh, picking him at that engine. This baffles, for those that don't understand it, this baffles around the around the. Uh, air-cooled cylinder heads of this. And so the, the birds get into these baffles in nice, tight, protected space, and they get in and make a nest. Well, you should be looking for that immediately for an airplane that's been sitting around any length of time, not after you've been out running it for, for an hour or whatever it was. So that, that calls into question his uh, desire to get this airplane back to Florida quickly which may have impacted his decision-making. Decision and 
and then to try to initiate uh, the impossible turn. And it's called that the impossible turn because unless you're a very experienced pilot in practice, this U-turn back to the airport that you just left, the, the outcome is almost always the same. You stall the airplane and crash out of the, of the runway. So for him to, to uh, try to do that on 100 hours total time and in, in airplanes, not even in this airplane, I mean, I think that was absolutely another bad decision on his part, obviously. Reviewing both the accident report and the public docket, uh, there wasn't much we can find out specifically about the second person in the aircraft, whether that person was along for the ride, whether that person was another mechanic who was checking on the first mechanic's work. So there's no indication of what um, assistance this person provided, nor is there any other indication that someone other than the accident pilot was doing uh, the maintenance work on the aircraft. And again, no matter who you are, no matter what kind of work you're doing, um, one person isn't perfect. Two people aren't perfect either, but if you have two people with knowledge on a subject, it's usually a better outcome than one person with knowledge on a subject. And clearly, the accident pilot had a motivation to get the airplane where it was going and might have been a much stronger motivation than someone who had no skin in the game, someone who was not invested in the aircraft, someone who was being as objective as possible, looking at what this person's doing, looking at what this person may have overlooked. Yes. Yes. It, it really is a tragedy for both. But just I just decision making, just I shake my head because it, it, it did I ever take risk? Yes, I did. Would I have taken this risk? No, I would not have. And I keep hopping on our, in our programs about trying to make that impossible turn. We see it so many times in accidents, so many stall accidents, because they don't get the speed, they don't have the altitude. So uh, they keep this to, to have the glide. And also what um, struck me about this is, as with many of these investigations we look at, there are questions that seem fairly simple and straightforward, but are not answered by the material that, that's available. One of them being was the previous owner had wanted to restore the aircraft. At some point during the 15 years this previous owner had the aircraft, the owner decided not to continue with the work. Nothing in here stated what had been done to the aircraft, what changes, what upgrades had been done, you know, whether or not there was a, a certified inspector a certified mechanic to inspect what had been done previously. So this person who presumably is unfamiliar with the aircraft comes up from Florida, has to deal with the airplane as it is. And as it is may include not having documentation as to what exactly was done over the years and what, what problems might have been found out during the previous 15 years that weren't conveyed to the, to, to the new owner. And certainly, and this one really jumped out at me, what about the instrumentation on the aircraft? Was the airspeed indicator, vertical speed indicator, altimeter, or the basic equipment that he needed? By the way, this was a, uh, not an IFR uh, rated pilot. So did this pilot, the mechanic, even have the basic instruments to do VFR flying back to Florida? We don't know. Yeah. I mean, the pr most prudent thing would have been to take the wings off put it on a trailer and drive it back, which is uh, pretty common. But it takes a lot of work to take the wings off and, and probably didn't have the equipment there to, to uh, help hold the, the wings up when he disconnects them from the airplane. So but that would have been a, another uh, better decision than try to fly a sick airplane back or an airplane that, that Hadn't flown for a long time. Who knows what condition that engine was in internally. Because it runs, because you're able to make it run, doesn't mean it's still okay inside. Been sitting for a long time. Uh, it's probably got rust in areas that maybe it didn't have before. Maybe it broke piston ring uh, or, or more. I mean, with all speculation, the NTSB report was pretty weak, really, at answering any of those questions. I, it was more like uh, the most obvious cause. And, uh, oh, yeah, this guy wasn't qualified. He did 
the engine wasn't running right, and you know, that's the that's the reason. It satisfies the F, the NTSB's need, but it doesn't really satisfy the needs of the aviation community to know what's going on, so that we can have issues to face and uh, address. You know, so it leaves an unanswered question, which I'm used to anymore with with uh, with the NTSB because they never seem to get to the the uh, general aviation maintenance issues. Even the airline maintenance issues, they're pretty weak in, weak on. But the J GA side, they're, they're really, really weak. Now, so, one thing about this uh, investigation, it, it did occur. It was a 2021 event, so this is a recent um, uh, event. And we have a public docket. We don't have a public docket from events from 15, 20 years ago. And sometimes there are things that make you scratch your head. It's like, why is this in here? One of the things that, that caught our attention was there was actually a letter from the insurance company in the public docket where the person was saying, oh, yes, we had insurance on this person, but not for the aircraft he was flying. And this is the hours he had from the other aircraft and such. There was no document in there stating whether or not there was current insurance on this accident flight aircraft. Not that it matters, but uh, it's one of these things where we t we push all the time the idea of, hey, insure your, insure your aircraft call our sponsor of MCO, get a quote, don't fly without insurance. So on the one hand, I can't fault the person for wanting insurance. On the other hand, I'm faulting in TSB for not explicitly saying, was this accident aircraft insured or not? Now, going back to a previous subject, let's take off your flight safety detectives hat and put on your maintenance hat. If you had come across a piston engine aircraft that had been sitting around 15 years, uh, let's assume there's no bird nest or anything else on it. Let's just talk about fuel and oil. If you have fuel or oil sitting in an engine for 15 years, what are the things that could happen that might still be there, even if you drain the fuel and the oil and fill it up with new fuel and new oil? Well, it's all on the oil side, it's corrosion and fats that get up inside there. So an engine that sat, just, just talk about the oil. An engine that sat that long, I would drain the oil out, fill it up, run it, drain the oil out again, and also look at it and maybe even send it out to be analyzed to see what comes up inside that oil because all of the moving parts in there. Have we have we got a crankshaft that's got a problem? Do we have a camshaft that has a problem? All right. Was it sitting there and got rusty? Now it's gonna look it's gonna screw up the lifter. It's the potential potential to screw up the lifter. I mean it just the list goes on and on on that. On the fuel side, that fuel that was in the airplane guaranteed was no good. So he and he must have, based upon what we we saw, they, he must have drained the tanks completely. But did he inspect them to see if there was anything in the tanks? That, you know, that's another piece. You know, was there some debris in the tank that was above the fuel that was in it? So let's say, yeah, let's say those tanks held thirty-five or forty gallons a side, and he drained out whatever fuel was in there. Well, what was above that fuel level? The fuel level was probably five or 10 gallons. So in that dead space, that was above the fuel that was in there. Was there something else in there? Did he look inside there? Right. One of the things that I was suspect with is that he made it to the, uh, to the first airport to get 66 gallons of fuel. So obviously 66 gallons of fuel is going to put Fill up those tanks or, or, or more, a hell of a lot more than it was sitting on the airport with. And could that have dislodged something in the fuel, in the tank, fuel tank, and was floating around in there and then found its way into the, into the fuel filter and clogged it? So, I mean, it's just a lot of questions that the NTSB didn't, didn't uh, answer in the report. What you just mentioned made us uh, maybe flash back to a, an accident we did a, gosh, a year or so ago, Harrison Ford's crash in Santa Monica. Uh, that was a, a restoration as well, apparently a very well-funded, very well, thoroughly done restoration of a World War II training aircraft. And I remember something about the accident report where they had had a ground run up for like an hour or so before takeoff, and the engine seemed to be doing okay. Took off and they had an engine problem. This person... Uh, clearly had all sorts of, uh, in the accident we're talking about today, clearly had all sorts of audible uh, issues with the engine that were heard by witnesses. 
And there's nothing in there that showed that it was uh, being run for any considerable length of time. So again, getting back to what you're saying, there are very specific things one should go through systematically and carefully when it comes to getting an airplane up and running again. And this is a one person, uh, at most two person effort to get this airplane up and running. It's not clear that this was done adequately. Uh, let's move to other systems. 15 years in the ground, what about the mechanical system, the control uh, wires for flight control systems, et cetera? What kind of degradation or corrosion would you see in something sitting on the you know, hangar or on the tarmac in North Carolina for 15 years? Oh, yeah, nice high, high uh, humidity area, aluminum, I mean. It does, there's no indication this was a structural failure anyway. But you know what? Cables do rust, and you do have problems in elsewhere in the airplane. So, you know, we don't know from what the NTSB put in the report if, it, if they looked at any of that. So it just leaves, the report leaves a lot of unanswered questions. But the first step one in this report on causation is decision making. Right. He made lousy decisions as a mechanic, it appears, and lousy decisions as a pilot. So it just calls him to question his actions. And that's probably why the NTSB just jumped on, on pilot failure, because it, that just jumps right out at you. And it's a huge number. If you put a percentage on the accident, it's a huge number compared to the potential of any of the others. But it still leaves us hanging out here that try to promote safety and try to identify issues that people can address in safety. I mean, I do it every every, every podcast about addressing the pre, pre-flight planning, addressing the pre-flight inspection of the airplane. Those are things that we can do very easily to help ensure the airplane is not going to crash. And yet we find many, many, many cases where that's just not done. Now, you just mentioned uh, insure with an E, and also you've had a lot of experience with insure with an I. If you're an insurance company or you're giving advice to an insurance company that's thinking of insuring an aircraft that's been sitting on the ground for 15 years, is there are, are there a special bunch of red flags or requirements that a company insurance company usually has before they grant insurance for an aircraft like this? Uh, if the insurance company were aware of it, they would probably say, you know, you know, we're not ready to insure the airplane yet. But most likely it would be masks. You know, he wouldn't mention where the airplane was from. The registration was obviously kept up. Uh, so there'd be no indications to the outside world, the condition of the airplane. So it would be up. But you know, today, uh, all these accidents that we're having are driving up the insurance rates for everybody. And today, the cost to repair the airplanes is just climbing like crazy. The cost of the parts to make the repairs are climbing like, like crazy. And that's going to be reflected in the insurance rates that the pilots are going to have to see, uh, are beginning to see now. They haven't even seen it yet. I think that we're going to see a, a real spike in insurance coming up. And so people that buy an airplane should make sure that they have adequate insurance. You don't want to leave your family holes in the bag uh, for damages to, that you've caused with your airplane because they're going to come after somebody to pay for it. And if you're renting airplanes, dear God, if you're renting airplanes, please, please get a rental insurance to protect yourself, protect your family, because, you know, rental insurance it sort of indicates that you're a student pilot or a new pilot and most avid pilots already have uh, an airplane if they're that avid. So if you if you're learning to fly, a relatively new pilot, make sure you have insurance, uh, and make sure you ha you have medical insurance on yourself, because not all airplanes are, accidents are fatal, and uh, you know you could end up with huge hospital bills. It's not uncommon today, and I have a, I have a relative that does medical billing. And uh, she talks about seeing medical bills for one hospital visit in this five and six hundred thousand dollar range. Right, and I just when she said that, I thought thinking about myself. I don't, I don't have enough insurance, medical insurance to cover that. Most people don't know that you're 
if you buy medical insurance from Blue Cross Blue Shield or somebody like that, there's a limit on how much they pay. There's a total limit. And it's usually four or five hundred thousand dollars. And then today's cost of medicine and cost of medical care, it's obviously very easy uh, to reach those numbers given them what my roles have said to me. So if you if you are flying as a pilot, make sure you got adequate insurance. If you're a student renting airplanes, make sure you protect yourself with a rental insurance policy and protect your family and and don't leave them hanging because you love to fly. You want to you want to be a pilot, but something bad happens and you're gonna leave them hanging. No, so think of think of uh, all the consequences and get enough insurance coverage to protect yourself. And that sounds like a good place to end. <laughs> well, not before I do my next to last word, and it's gonna be directly related to the show we did today. Because when we were planning for a show, we didn't have a particular accident in mind. So I said, Oh, let me just go to the NTSB. A database, look for an accident report that has a public docket, because usually there's stuff in both that gives you insight. We came across a couple, and this one just jumped right out at me. It's like, oh my goodness, this is a combination of things I haven't heard of before. So my recommendation is, let's say you want to learn something about accidents and incidents, and it's something close to what you're doing, a particular model, a particular airport, what have you. Uh, have fun with the NTSB database, go through and see if there's something that is along the lines of that and see if there's something you can't learn. Something I've actually done for the airports I fly to frequently during my training. It's like, well, gee, when's the last time this airport has had an accident? Is there something about that accident that will inform how I do my approaches, how I do my departures and my taxing when I'm on this airport? So again, use the NTSB database and other aviation databases for educational purposes. Yeah, the information is out there. All we're doing is gathering the information and put a little bit of our expertise on it and putting it out there to try to identify those problems for people. And that gets to what I always say at the end. Why do I talk about pre-planning? Because we see a lot of accidents in our research that involve pre-planning that if it was done properly, the accident likely would not have occurred. Why do I talk about good pre-flight inspections of the airplane? For the same reason, because we see a number of accidents and incidents. Now, remember, they're not all fatals, but we see a lot of these accidents that occur uh, because a lousy pre-flight was done by the pilot. And why do I say put your head on a swivel? Because we still have the mid-air collisions. And because the risk is so high now because of so many student pilots around some airports, you really got to be concerned. And if, especially if it's not your home airport. And if you're going, if you're going to build time and you flew you flew uh, 250 miles away from your home airport, do you know what's going on in that airport you're flying into? Do you know that there's a flight school opened six months ago because of the of the demand for pilots? And now that airspace is loaded with with rookie pilots, so to speak. And so those are all things that you have to take into consideration to make sure that you've eliminated all the risk that you can before you go flying, because flying is risky. But you got to, why take on extra risk? Eliminate all the, and control all the risk you can. And that's all we're trying to do. This program is identify it, get it, put it in your head. And we know we're reaching some people. I mean, I even get emails from airline pilots that tell me that they've changed the way they've done their walkarounds based upon what we've said in some of our programs. That those that specifically address the airline side, right? So we know that there's people out there that are listening, but I don't know that we're getting to all of it. But we'll keep trying. You know, most I don't think most people realize that when you've been involved in the accident side of the business, investigators, Greg and I, uh, and other people like yourself, Todd, uh, it's painful. It's hard to go to accident sites and or read reports where if you're in the, in the person's shoe, you're saying, why in the hell would they do that? Why? Like, I mean, I honest to God, sometimes I'll just say, that, no, I'll put my hands up and say, no, as I'm reading it, because you can see where it's going. Uh, so please, if you're out there and you're a pilot, especially a new pilot, don't... Uh, 
take lightly what we say. We're talking from experience and we're trying to put some of our, our experience, our knowledge and our pain into your head so that you can protect yourself. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.